Hey, thanks for joining us. We are through this month going through a series called This Is My Story, where you'll be hearing different stories and journeys uh, from people within our church family. I know you will be greatly encouraged because what God has done through their lives, He can also do for you. And so be encouraged as you hear this story. Today, I'm going to be sitting with Busola, and you're going to be greatly encouraged by what God has brought her through. So here is Busola with her story. So Busola, mm -hmm. thank you for taking time to sit with me today. As you know, we're in this series called This Is My Story. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there might be a few in our church who know your story or maybe who are going to watch this on YouTube one day. But why don't you take us back then to the beginning? Mm -hmm. Because um, to understand and appreciate what God has done today, uh, oftentimes we need the context of what was life like growing up. Um, so take us back and I'm just going to let you take us on this journey because this, this is your story after all. Okay, well thank you for having me. Um, it's an honor to be here to be able to share my testimony and I think it's more of God's testimony than it is my testimony and I really pray it blesses um, one or two people so um, a little backstory um, for, from a family of four. Um, I'm four of four, I'm three girls and one boy. Wow. And um, he's um, two of four, he's not the first. Everyone always thinks he's the first, but he's not. And um, I was born in Lagos, Nigeria. Um, I had my um, early education there and up to university actually. And um, I moved to the U.S. to get um, a degree, a master's degree, and a lot of things changed. I think that's when God started to um, orchestrate his plans um, for my life. But mm. that's kind of like um, the basics of kind of where I grew up and where I'm from. Amazing. Amen. <laughs> and uh, like you were serving the Lord yes. from a young age. Yes. Uh, um, yeah, talk to us about your journey now, not, you know, from your family's perspective, mm -hmm. but your journey with Jesus, because okay. we understand it's a personal decision, right? So yes. at what age around were you choosing, hey, I'm going to serve Jesus, I want to follow him mm -hmm. and uh, discover this plan? Um, so I was born um, Christian. My whole family has been Christian for a long time, but um, originally Catholic, right? And um, I went to Christian schools right from kindergarten to university. So I have always known of God. But I think I remember it was about when I was about 12, when I had a question about, about the rosary. So that was my first, I would, my first early memory of like, what is this and who is God and all of this stuff. Even though um, while being in Christian schools, they always talk about God, but my first personal question about it, I think I was about 12. But I would say like as an adult or young adult, probably 18 was when I actually made like a real decision. Mm -hmm. Like I want to surrender. Um, I had given my life to him multiple times, like <laughs> almost every other Sunday. But I think when I was about 18, I was like, I really want to do this. I just had this feeling that I had to because of the journey I had for some weird reason when I was 18. I had this feeling that some, like the next 12 years of my life was supposed to be for him fixing me. I don't know. I just had that thought. So that's it. Interesting. Two quick questions. Uh -huh. One, with the rosary, yeah. who did you go to for an answer? So it was Just curious. It was one of our family friends. Um, she was in the room, and I think the interesting thing about the rosary I had was it glowed in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> so it was fun, right? And I just asked her, like, so why do we do this? And how many times do we say the Hail Mary? Like, what is all this about? Wow, yeah. So it was just a family friend. She was a few years older than I was at the time. So Okay, that was just my curiosity <laughs> yeah. coming to light. Um, so... Age 18, like you mm -hmm. said, you surrender your life to Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, in my personal experience being a pastor, coming to Christ doesn't mean life suddenly turns sweet and everything is, is pretty and organized and fixed. 
like you already alluded to. Um, what was happening in your life after you gave your life to Christ at age 18? Um, what, what did the journey look like for you at, at the start? So initially there wasn't any like significant thing that happened when I did, you know, finally surrender. It's not like anything particular that I can remember. Um, but I know that the time when I decided to give it my surrender my life to him was it was a Sunday service and I can't remember who was preaching in my school chapel. It was either the the VC or his wife. And she was talking about hate. She said, um, some of you um, hate people and you shouldn't. And in my head, I'm like, yeah, I don't hate people. And then she's like, some of you hate people and you don't know that you hate people. And I'm like, that's strange. And as soon as she said that, a thought popped in my head because um, I didn't grow up with my father. He wasn't really in the picture. And he came to mind and I was like, I don't hate him because I didn't really know him at the time. So that picks my interest, and I think that's probably where the Holy Spirit's there working to help me understand the dynamics of that relationship. And like I said, I knew in that moment that the next, I had a feeling that the next 12 years of my life mm. was going to be about fixing what was broken. I didn't know what was broken. I didn't understand anything, but that was what prompted me to do that. And after that decision, nothing significant happened. I continued living my life. I was, you know, serving. I'd been, I've been serving in church since I can remember. I was in the kids ministry for a very long time. And that's what I did. I used to help decorate the sanctuary. And wow. that's what I've been doing for a really long time. And uh, I would say things started to shift when I graduated. So I was about 21. Now that's when everything really, really changed. So like three years after that. Yeah, because you're saying like you, you sensed a season of fixing things was coming. Yeah. So yeah, take us there. Like, so you, you had that thought pop in your head about mm -hmm. your father and the relationship. Mm -hmm. is, is that where the fixing had to start for you? Yes, because I knew something was different about me. I just had a feeling that I was always trying to fit in with everybody because I always felt like I was not, I had to put on what people wanted to see mm. because I didn't think they understood the real me, you know? Yeah. And I didn't think it was normal to do that, but that was the only way I felt I had to have community or whatever, right. having friends or all that stuff. And what really prompted that was marriage. Everyone always talks about when you graduate, you get married and all of those things. And I knew in my soul that I did not want to get married in my 20s because of the fixing. There was something in my head like they, you can't get married like this. And I was like, well, God, hmm. I probably get married when I'm 30. Like there's 12 years for you to fix. That's a lot enough time yeah. for you to fix what's broken. So that's kind of where it started and understanding that um, and people always said, your father is your first love. And I was confused because I didn't have that. So I was like, what is going to, what am I going to do now that I didn't have that? How do I fix that? Mm. And um, I think by the time I turned 21 um, was when I was let into the world in terms of I wasn't in school, right. it's time to get a job and all this other stuff. And that's when I started to really, really walk with God because I had to ask him questions. Do I apply for this job? Do I like, what do I do? What's next? And talking about the, the dad role, um, that's a role that my brother took on like from early on. Like he, he's who I look at as like my dad, but it's not the same. Yeah. But yeah, he was able to at least do his best to fill whatever void um, of having like a significant male figure in your life. And I'm, I'm forever grateful for that. Amen. Amen. Yeah, so in your story then, now you're in your early 20s. Mm -hmm. um, your brother's filling in this role mm -hmm. um, that your dad would have played, perhaps. Um, what happens next in your journey of 
discovering what God needs to fix. So at the time, I thought I was going to um, get a job, then work a, f a few years, and then go get my master's degree, and then come back, and then get married and have kids. That's what I thought. So I prayed, and I thought, you know, God would answer all of those prayers. And, and right? on paper, it looks very good, yeah, right? Yeah, it Clean sounds like a simple. great plan. Like, it's not that difficult, right? <laughs> so I think that was the, the beginning of the shock, because I graduated the best um, in my department, in my university. Um, I'm not surprised by that. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I was the best in my in the business administration department. So everyone thought my whole life was pretty set. Like, you know, you have a degree, you have you come from a good family, you're gonna get a job like that. And I thought that was gonna happen too. So when it wasn't happening, I got very frustrated and I went to God and I'm like, what's going on? Like this is not the plan. Like, why is, why is every door closed? And I could mm. not, I would get interviews and nothing. I would write tests and pass the test and nothing. I had, you know, interviewers like commend me and give me compliments. And I'm like, but I need a job, you know, so, but right. I never landed the job. And then the real journey started with one particular job I was applying to. And I knew in my soul that this was God's plan because it was like a five-stage interview process. Wow. And every stage was intense and shocking. And I still like went through, even there was a computer-based test, I did not submit that test. I didn't finish and I still passed. So that was like the second stage. So I was like, oh, of course God is with me. Like if I didn't even finish and I still passed, and then there was like three other steps after that. And it came to the, the end and they told me no. In fact, during my final interview, the two ladies were not listening to me. One was on the phone. Wow. Yeah, it was very strange. And that broke me completely. I think that was the first heartbreak I got yeah. from like God because I was like, why would you take me through this process just to, you know, leave me hanging? Because and I turned down other opportunities that my family had set up. So it was, not, it was a mm. really tough one. Mm -hmm. And I remember the final day of that interview, I had another interview that someone, my sister-in-law had set up for me, and I did not go there. And I, that was the first time I heard the audible voice of God, when I was like, should I go here or should I go there? When I said here for the other one, I heard a no. And I remember this because I was walking in the street and I had to look back, like, was there someone behind me? Wow. And that job would have required me to work on a Sunday, intermediate, like not every Sunday, but they could schedule me on a Sunday. And I knew I didn't want that because I was growing in my faith and Sunday was like, I have to be in church. It's I an can't be. Day. So I felt like God didn't want me to go there. Also hearing that no, and I just went to the other one. So I was question like did I really hear him or what happened but that was the first time that I got like heartbroken with God and I didn't talk to him for a while because <laughs> I was confused um what do I do and um I left it all I said you know what I have given it my best and whatever happens happens and a few months after that I got the opportunity to go get my master's degree in the states it was supposed to be one year it was literally supposed to be a one-year MBA program. Yep. And then that changed. As soon as I got there, <clears throat> excuse me, um, they canceled like the program that I was doing. And they were like, you have to do something else. And that was another like, God, what is happening again? Wow. But I, all of this was him directing me to where he wanted me to go. He was fixing he things. Was, exactly. <laughs> I, I wish I had remembered that, but he was fixing everything that I didn't know because it didn't look like what I thought it was supposed to Come be. On. But when I um, had that disappointment again of my program mm -hmm. being canceled, it wasn't canceled. I was getting an MBA with a minor in information systems because I thought a business degree and computer science at the time was a great idea. So they were like, you can't do both. You can only do one. 
And for someone who just graduated, an MBA is not like the best idea. So, but it was tough because that's why I'm here. Like, what do I do next? So I remember praying and crying and I didn't hear a voice. I didn't hear nothing. I just went with what was in my heart. And I chose to get a master's in information systems. Apparently, that's what I've been put on earth to do because I did not know I had love for technology. I had no idea that wow. this is what I'm supposed to do, not finance, like I was heading straight on for. Right. So that was the testimony and that even though I was thinking this was the journey, but he put me where I was supposed to do what I'm, and that's my career right now in that's, technology. That's wild. Yes, it is. I, I just want to add, like one of the, I think big things that I'm getting from your story so far is like what we count as a disappointment. Yeah. Like, God, where are you? You didn't come through. Like God is working things out. Mm -hmm. Romans 8, 28, all yeah. things for the good of those who love God yes. and called according to his purposes. So it, it's a really cool story so far. We're not yes. quite there yet. <laughs> not yet. Um, but but just as people would watch this, mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to state that as a, a, a highlight already of, man, when a door seems closed, mm -hmm. doesn't mean God is angry at you or upset. Yeah. Maybe he's just getting something aligned in yeah. our lives for what he actually built us for mm -hmm. and created us for. So I agree. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that at the time. I'm still learning that at this time too. Yeah. Because and, and that's the thing. When we're in the middle of it, often we can't see God's yeah. fingerprints on what we're doing. Yeah. But he's definitely involved. Hindsight is 2020. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. But yeah, um, that was, I would say that is the arching theme of my life. It's like, I think this is how it should go. And it's like, oops, nope. Uh, yeah, you thought wrong. But, um, not to skip, but my current walk with God, I am more confident in no's. In fact, I'm happy wow. with no's because at least we know that's not what you want me to do, as yeah. opposed to being like completely like broken. I, I mean, I still get disappointed. I'm like, oh, I thought it was going to happen, but not like the, cr I used to be really, really crushed to the point where I don't even want to pray. I'm just like, maybe this is not for me. Maybe he's... I'm too sinful, like, he's not looking at me, he's busy with dying children, you know, and I'm not right. like a priority, that's what I used to think then, but now I understand better that that's a lie, it's not true, Amen. he's just, it's not yet time to understand yeah. his timing, even though it's a blessing, his blessings are tied to his timing as well, um, yeah. That's so good. <laughs> All right, so let's continue on the journey. Okay, so um, I graduated and, um, and everything was going according to plan, like I thought. Um, I got a job after graduating and um, when I thought like my life was, you know, beginning to like take shape. And sorry, this is all in America now? Yes, yeah. so I did, I wanted to go back um, to Lagos so bad, like I used to go, um, home every Christmas. Um, I didn't feel like that was home. Mm. I felt like it was, and I think because originally I was supposed to be there for a year and now this is like five years after. Right. It's like, when am I going back, you know? Um, I didn't think that maybe that's not what God had in, in store for me. Remember my original plan, graduate, work, get a master's, come back, get married, have kids. So I'm trying to like get back, get on, that back track. on that track, you know. <laughs> so now, oh, the masters came. Now we need to go back so we can get married and have kids. But um, in 2017, um, um, unfortunately, my sister, my older sister passed. And um, she passed May 1st, um, 2017. Wow. And my birthday is May 5th. And there are 16 years between the both of us, but we're really close. She's like my person. Mm. Like, you know, the person that gets you? Yeah. Yeah. Like, we had inside, like, it was just perfect, even though we did butt heads a lot. Like, we couldn't stand each other, but there was <laughs> real love there. And um, she used to come to, because of me, whenever she had, like, a, 
anything to do like abroad with work, like she had all these conferences and stuff, she would pick New York because it was close to me. I was in Maryland because yeah. it was close. So I would go there and be there with her, like at the hotel, we'll go out, watch movies and, you know, just hang out. So we were really close, right? And this happened kind of suddenly. Um, and you can imagine the shock. Um, that was very devastating. And um, I remember the, the, the moment before I was told this, um, I felt in my heart like, this is the moment your life changes forever. I can't forget that. I cannot. And you didn't know why. I did not know. I just knew like, this is the moment your life changes forever. And I got in the room and they told me what happened. And I was just like, no, 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 no. And I couldn't feel my legs and I had to sit down. And um, I was wow. just overwhelmed by how did this happen? Like we were just on the phone like a few days before with all these plans that we had together. I was going to help her buy stuff to decorate her apartment. And like, you know, I'm just going through all of that. And um, I spoke with my brother briefly on the phone. And I knew in my heart that I couldn't go for the funeral because I knew I was never going to come back to the, like I, mm. I was never going to come back. There was no way I was going to get on a plane to come back. So, I was like, I'm not going to go wow. because even though I've always wanted to go back, I guess right. that was God as well, because he knew that his plan for me was not there. So I didn't go for the funeral. But after that, I went, I remember I went upstairs and I got on my knees and I prayed. I don't remember the prayer, but I know I prayed. Um, and that week was weird because even though I was hurting, I felt like I had really deep encounters with God. It was very strange. It was like he held me in his hand and like took the actual pain away. Mm. Just I think the shock of it was what he saved me from because wow. that I think could have sent me spiraling. And I think he like protected me just those few days, but I'm human after all, I have to grieve, right? Yeah, so, absolutely. Um, but I think the initial shock of, of that, he saved me from, um, I remember that Thursday, cause she, I got the news on a Monday, Thursday, I usually had like a house fellowship and I, I went there to tell them what had happened. And um, the leader was like, cause I was shivering, I was, a mess, yeah, like I was I, shaking, I like I was, kept asking me, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm okay. Like I'm, I know I'm shaking, but I can't control it. Like I'm, I'm not sick or anything. And he's like, what can we do for you? So I'm like, I just have a question. Am I ever going to laugh again? That I don't know why that was my question. Wow. I was like, am I ever, like, is that ever going to happen? And he said, yes. And I said, okay. So I went back home and the journey of healing started. And one thing I'm grateful to God for is he never let me go. I don't know how to describe it. Like, I didn't feel like praying. I didn't feel like doing all those things, but I did it. I didn't know that there was going to be healing. I didn't understand God as a healer like that then. Mm. But I, he didn't let me just go, you know? On. So I was still serving. I remember I had, I used to drive an hour plus to go teach kids at uh, Bibles, like sun, not Sunday on Wednesdays. I would oh. drive in traffic in an hour to church. And I went that Wednesday, even though I got this news and I'm, and I see the kids and I think kids are very intuitive and it, they would hug me I'm like, is everything okay? And I was fighting back tears because I wanted to tell someone everything is not okay. Right. But I had to put it together because I had a job. I had to teach these kids. Wow. And the whole time people would come in the classroom, I wanted one person to like look at me and ask me so I could unburden myself. Yeah. But that entire night, nobody did. And I went in my car and I broke down again feeling like, no one even sees that my whole world has crumbled, but I didn't give up. I continued 
teaching on Sundays. I was teaching kids as well, even though it was very painful. But for some reason, God did not let me go. You know, I wouldn't say I was the one who carried myself to keep going to church. And right. no, he there was something in me that he would just, Man. you know, she's not this is where she needs to be. So that happened um, 2017. And um, even though God was working with me in terms of healing and I was still in church, I was very, very broken. I remember I told you when I was 18, I felt like I needed fixing. Yeah. So this is like fixing on fixing. Wow. So um, I was carrying a lot of weight, a lot of pain from my child. Like it was a lot, right? And I didn't know how to, I hadn't learned, hadn't, thought of God as a healer in that sense. Right. I hadn't even imagined that that was how he, like how is, is he going to fix it? You know what I mean? So um, I carried that weight. I was still going to church. I was still serving, but I wanted out because it was painful every single day. And that's too much for any one person to carry. But I'm in church and I hear of freedom in Christ and I've given my life to Christ. I want that freedom. I want mm. to not feel all this pain, but I'm still trying to accomplish life. Right. I'm trying to, you know, get a better job, buy a house, Go through that checklist. get married, have kids <laughs> thinking that, okay, I still need to do this to keep moving forward. But God still had other plans. It's like, you need to heal. There's stuff that needs to be unpacked, but I didn't know at the time. But anyways, fast forward to 2022, I decided, like, I made up my mind. I am done carrying this burden because I wasn't hiding. I was very ashamed for some reason. So this is from 2017 yeah. to 2022. 2022. Yeah. Five years. Five years. Wow. I was carrying a lot of pain and I was very burdened and I was ashamed because of what had happened. I have no idea why I was ashamed. So I was in hiding. I was like a shell of myself, but I knew how to show up and look like everything's good. Play the part but yeah, and then it was, go back. I was the... so good at it, I forgot who I was. Wow. I was... I did not know how to remove the mask after, like, but I, the inside you know, right? But I was so comfortable in that. But in 2017, sorry, 2022, I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> I just have to, whatever is going to happen, I just need to let it go. And this was July, and the reason I remember it because I made an Instagram post about it, Isaiah 61 verse 3 the one about giving you a beautiful ashes. And mm. I, I said, I have read this scripture before, I have prayed this, but now I am taking it. Like it is, Come on. this is my testimony, right? Yeah. And I was very happy in that moment. I think I was happy for the, like genuinely for the first time, like, okay, things are gonna be great now. I'm gonna be free, I'm gonna be all these great things. And um, unfortunately, that was not what happened because um, two months after that, my brother passed. And if 2017 was a shock, wow. September of 2022 was, there are no words to describe what that was. And just for clarity, mm -hmm. because you were already in Canada by this point. Oh, so, yeah. So just fill in that gap um, and then... We'll, we'll get back to this. Uh, okay, so um, how did I move to Canada again? COVID? I'm trying to remember. So it was before COVID. I, I came here in 2019. And then I went back to, okay, so I came here in 2019. And then um, because of the transition, I was like, oh, when I moved here, it felt like home. I remember, I'm like, this could be home away from home. What I never felt in in Maryland, yeah. So I'm like, okay, if I'm not supposed to go back to Lagos, then this is the next place mm. that I I can choose to be home. I really, yeah, that was what happened. Um, 
So I decided to use the opportunity of the transition to go home to go see my sister's gravesite because even though I have gone to Lagos after the funeral, I never went there. I wow. couldn't go there. So I'm like, you got to go. <laughs> so that transition of me, you know, packing up from the States and coming here, um, I decided to go to Lagos. I thought I was going to be there for six months. Um, but then COVID happened and yeah. then I was there for like forever. Um, yeah, so that's how um, I finally moved. So in 2021, I moved back here. And that was, another, that was really tough because yeah. um, I had just come through, I was going through another difficult season where I experienced a disappointment where I thought, remember my checklist? Like, this is what's going to happen. Oh, yeah. And I felt like the rug was pulled right under my feet again. And I went to God crying, help me, what do I do? But anyways, I'm glad I had the opportunity to come here, but it was really tough because it was during lockdown. Yes. So I didn't have community. I didn't have all of that. Um, but I had God, I'm not gonna lie. I was fasting. Sometimes I forget I'm fasting, I wake away. Am I fasting today? Am I not fasting today? Because I just, I knew I needed saving. Like, I was a mess. Yeah. But yeah, so that's kind of like the break between when I left the US and, and when I moved here. Um, but back to what happened with my, my brother, um, it was sudden as well. Um, I was on my computer working and I got the news. My cousin called me and he's like, cause, um, I had just moved apartments and he was going to help me, um, get furniture. So mm. he was like, he's found one. I think we should go see. And before then a, a little, you know, backtracking, I was on a fast. I was on a 21 day fast that went further than 21 days because of a few things. So that day was the last day of my fast. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it was, um, yeah, it was a Tuesday. That day was the last day of the fast. And the Monday I was at the office, I was feeling uncomfortable for some weird reason, but I didn't know why. So, and I've learned that when you don't know what to pray, speak in tongues. So I was speaking in tongues, Amen. right? And then the next day, Tuesday, the feeling didn't go away. So I recorded myself. I recorded myself telling myself not to worry. And I remember the scripture, it's in, it's in Psalms. It, it appears twice about, why are you downcast over my soul? Rejoice in the Lord. I say, yeah, that scripture. Yeah. So that was what came to me. So I prayed. I recorded myself encouraging myself, like, look, don't worry. What you're praying to God for is going to happen. Like, don't be discouraged. You know, keep your faith alive. And I remember, you know, being excited about that. Then my cousin came and he tells me, I didn't know what he was coming to tell me. So we get in the car to go. And he doesn't start the car and I'm strapped with my seatbelt. And I'm like, hmm. why aren't you starting the car? Because I'm yapping away. I don't know yeah, what's yeah. happening, right? And then he's like, oh, I got, I got some bad news. And I was like, no. What's crazy is when my sister happened and they told me there was some news, I felt in my heart that it was her. So weird, I don't know, I just mm. felt it was her. And then with him, when he said I have bad news, I just knew it was him. I just knew it was my brother. Because wow. he's like, and I said, did someone die? And he's like, yeah. And then I said, don't tell me it's my brother. Because I already had the feeling yeah. it was him. But he didn't answer and I'm waiting for him. It's not like I wanted to be somebody else, but... <laughs> And I'm waiting for him and he doesn't answer. And I'm like, oh my God, I can't breathe. I'm trying to get, and I'm like, no, I can breathe. Because if I can't breathe, I won't be saying I can't. Like I was going through all of this. Yeah, the shock. Yeah, and the next thing I know, he was picking me up from the ground. I don't know how I got there. I feel like I blacked out. Because I remember I was in the car strapped. The next thing, he was carrying me off the ground. Because I, I don't know. Uh. I think for a second, I may have lost my mind. But yeah, that was... There, there are no words to describe that whole feeling. And I had to fly back like two days after for the funeral. The whole thing is a blur, to be honest. I knew I had to be here and do this and do that. I 
had to read his biography, is that what it's called? A eulogy? Not a eulogy, like I had to read like his story, like he was born oh, yeah, here yeah. and he did this. And I'm like, I have to do that. So I could only do that by pretending he wasn't my brother. I was just reading a story about some guy. <laughs> Because there's no so way that's going on in your head yeah. as you're yeah. Having that's the to only way it. I could read that because wow. there's absolutely no way I can read that knowing who I'm like. Yeah. So I read it like a newscaster, to be honest. That's what was going through my mind. Like just yeah, um, and I had to do it twice. Wow. I had to do it on, at the service of songs, and then I had to do it at the actual day of the funeral. Right. Wow. The the second time was harder because his coffin was right there, and I was like, and everyone is looking at you with like sorry eyes. That's the worst. Yeah. And I'm trying to like ignore everybody, not because I don't care, but because I have to do this, you know. But anyways, all of that happened, and I got back here. And in that process, everyone is like, you know, telling me um, to be strong or whatever, and all these things, and they're making promises they can't keep. And it's like, eh, I was here five years ago. You don't know what you're saying. <laughs> right. But um, I understand they're just trying to be nice, and there are people who basically were shaming me and my family for not being good enough Christians because why is this happening to you guys all again? And they were Christians, um, by the way, that were saying things like that. Um, but anyways, that was back in Nigeria yeah. and I'm trying to hold it together, right? Because I've been here before, but this mm -hmm. is not the same. Yeah. Even though I know what it feels like, this is not the same. So. I'm trying to do it right, which is crazy because there's no right way to do it. But I don't want to be broken because I know how hard it is to get together. I remember telling God, I don't have five years. I told mm, him to grieve. I don't have five years. Yeah. Like, I don't know why you let this happen. I'm not sure why this happened, but I don't have five years. And... Um, before that happened, I had a dream. Before my brother passed, I had a dream. And it was a negative dream where someone passed, but it wasn't my brother in the dream. And I prayed about it and it felt very real because I was like rebuking the devil and like, you have no say here. You're like underneath my feet and stuff like that. So I was scared that maybe I didn't do enough. Mm. So I felt a little responsible for his passing. Like maybe if I told a pastor, maybe we could have prayed and prevented what happened, right? So I was going through all of that and I was trying to to hold it together. Yeah. I didn't want to stop teaching the kids. I didn't want to stop work. I just wanted to continue, but I was really heartbroken, right? And everyone thought I was heartbroken because my brother passed and I was missing my brother. I'm like, no, that's not it. <laughs> I don't understand this. Wow. This is this was what I was dealing with before I could even get to my brother not being here anymore. Right. So this is what was hurting me. And when I do this, I mean me and God. Like that's that was my grief wow. initially because I felt we were tight. Like I used to call Jesus my best friend. So I'm like, what kind of best friend are you if you're going to take my brother away and remember he's like my dad so he's like taking two people from me and i'm trying to be a good christian they tell you to not grieve like the people of the world and i'm trying to not grieve right. like people of the world but god knows what's in my heart he knows i'm hurting and then um after a couple of weeks um there was a day where i just couldn't take it anymore and I sat at the edge of my bed and I just broke down, right? And I felt in my heart, God, tell me I've been waiting for you. And that was, mm. it still gets me emotional because I was over here thinking I had to be perfect. I had to 
do everything right, to right. be worthy of his acceptance. But he was telling me, it's okay. Wow. <sighs> yeah. And that really, it touched me in a very special way because I could actually be me, finally. <sighs> I didn't think I was That's okay. Cry. All good. Oh my God. Yeah. But that was a very special moment for me because I could be myself. For years and years, I've been trying to be something just so that he can accept me. But he already did accept me even though I was broken. Amen. I think I need a moment. Yes, that's okay. So um, after he it was like, I've been waiting for you, it just gave me the opportunity to really open up my heart to him. And I told him, I'm like, I'm angry at you. Mm. I'm disappointed. I'm like, you broke my heart. And I told him, when people break my heart, I come to you. But now you've broken my heart. Who do I go to? Like, these are the conversations I had with him. And I'm like, how do you expect me to go on? You, my sister is gone. My brother's gone. Oh, before this, my bad, I skipped the part where my father passed away five weeks after putting my brother in the ground. I forgot that part. Wow. Yeah, so that was why I was so overwhelmed that I had to break down, and, and God was yeah. like, you know, yeah. So that was a lot. That was... That's a lot. That was too much, to be honest. It was, yeah, it was too much. And I think that's why God gave me that opportunity to, like, unburden myself, because He knows no one person should have to carry all of this weight, right? So after that happened, um, that was towards the end of the year. Um, I was unable to read my Bible at the time. I've had that Bible for about eight years, and I, it's really special to me because whenever I prayed, I would, you know, read Scripture, and I knew where it was. I knew it was at the top. Like, I knew, oh, yeah, yeah. but I couldn't open it because it was like a dagger in my heart. It's like, mm. you pray this, but then look at your life. That was kind of the battle I had. Wow. And I told God, and I, but I knew the word of God was the only way out of whatever I was going through, but I didn't know how to get there. And then I'm like, God, I, got, I have to get a new Bible. Like, that's the, like, I can't, like, forget that Bible. We're moving on. I have to get a new Bible. So um, this was December 29th, I think. So I ordered a new Bible off of Amazon. But unfortunately, at that time, my best friend was sleep. I would sleep 12, 13 hours. I would wake up and be like, nope, I got to go back to sleep because that's the only place I had peace. Yeah. So wow. I slept through the, the um, delivery of my Bible. And I was like, oh, no, I need to start the new year with this Bible because I need to be fixed. So I contacted the. Luckily for me, the driver had been calling and texting, but I was in another world. Wow. So I texted back, I'm like, I'm sorry, can you please, you know, bring it back? Like, um, I didn't get a response, so I went to customer care on Amazon, and they were like, yeah, you know, it's the holiday, you will get it the next business day, which was December, uh, January 2nd, which was a Tuesday. I'm like, no, I need this Bible, like, now, because I need to be fixed. <laughs> so um, I called the number, maybe I text again, and I think I call, and the guy says, oh, don't worry, I'll bring it back. He brought my Bible that day, and I knew for the first time I believed mm. that God was with me because wow. there is no way I should have gotten that Bible that same day. You know how deliveries work. They miss <laughs> you, that's they it. They move on. And it's the holidays. Yeah. Yeah. So I was happy that, okay, uh, you know, God is with me. We're going to, everything is going to be good. So 2023 comes, and then in February, you give a call um, about testimonies. And I'm like, testimonies? I'm not even out of the woods. <laughs> like, what am I telling? But when you asked the next menu, my hand was up. Were you I'm the like, first I was the first. I was, I was and I'm say. like, why was my hand up? Like, <laughs> you're literally in hell right now. Like, what are you testifying about? But I said to myself, the fact that I'm here is a testament is because testament. I had no hope. That's another thing. I was hopeless. There was no vision. Everywhere was just dark. 
I couldn't dream. I could not believe. The only prayer I could pray was for other Christians, hmm. other people. I could not pray for myself. Wow. I couldn't. It's not like I didn't want to, but there was no looking at my life. What do I mm-hmm. pray for? You right. know. So, but I'm like, I would pray for other people. I would whatever. You know. So when my hand was up, I'm like, why is my hand up? But anyways, I I go up there, and I read. Psalm 34, verse 7. Okay. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered uh, me from all of my fears. Yeah, that's, that's the, right. yeah, it's that one. And now I look back, that was me prophesying into my future. Wow. Because after sharing that testimony, and I said, sometimes God doesn't save you from things. He saves you through. Mm. And it, it's on the church's Instagram page, yeah. actually. And I didn't know I was prophesying into my future because that's exactly what happened in 2023. It was a year of the Lord delivering me from things I didn't know, from abandonment, rejection, anger. I was an angry person, apparently, you know. Um, Obviously, the grief of losing uh, my siblings, that was a really, really deep, deep, especially my brother it was a there was a pain in there that I couldn't reach I remember God telling me like your soul is wounded Mm. let me heal that because even though I had moved forward I was still in pain and I'm like God why am I still feeling it's like your soul is wounded you have to let me heal your soul and what that meant was I was still hurting from all the disappointments of my unanswered prayers I prayed for my sister and she passed. I prayed for my brother and he passed. I prayed reconciliation with my, my family for my father. And he never really acknowledged me per se, you know, mm. and all of that. So I was still carrying that wound. And he's like, let me heal you from that as well. So um, the whole of 2023 was deliverance wow. and healing. And... Um, while that was happening, it did not feel like it. It felt like I was getting worse. It felt like the whole world was, like, my life was a mess. That's what it felt like. Yeah. But what God taught me through that season was to forget my feelings. Mm. So even though I did not feel like it, I still came to church. I still served. I still did all of these things. Not because I was trying to fulfill all righteousness, but because... God is God in spite of my life. Right. That's one thing that was very clear. That's a great Like, outlook. God is still God, regardless of what's happening to me. And he told me nothing is happening to you. It's happening in life, but you are a part of that. Mm. So he helped me separate the victim mentality I had. Like, oh, look at my life. Nothing's have nothing good is happening. Like you took my sister, you took my brother, you never even gave me a dad per se, you know. Right. And he's like, No, I didn't take these people and they're not even yours. That was a hard truth. He said, They're not yours, they're mine. You should be grateful and wow. be honored that you had you, you had the chance to know them. And that shifted my perspective. It was a hard truth to hear because you think God is always soft and tender. Sometimes he's like, (laughs) you know, and that was an ax he dropped on me, but it freed me from me, me, me to look outside of myself. So all of that happened in that season. And I remember saying that if I wasn't walking in the valley of the shadow of death, I'm on the alley next to the valley of the shadow of death or the street next because that (laughs) felt like it. And I would always say that. And then one day, I guess it was the Holy Spirit saying, you do know you can rejoice in the valley. Right. And I was like, how? Like, isn't it supposed to be dead? Like, you know, and I just stood up and I started dancing. And I was dancing and it was like I could visualize myself like walking through this valley that I had you know, convinced myself I was in. Um, And I think that was another deliverance from whatever that was, that feeling of rejection or feeling Mm. of the grief, how it like kind of holds you down. And um, I had another encounter where I felt like I was on fire physically, 
even though it's not real. Yeah. But I was in a lot of pain that I could feel it. And I was like, God, why aren't you helping me? Like, why would you be there watching this kind of things happen to me? And I literally was like, Jesus, help me. Like, I was crying, like, Jesus, help me. And he said, remember my temptation? I'm like, yes. He said, what did I do? I said, you spoke the word. And he said to me, speak the word. Hmm. And I carried my Bible and I was flipping through, just reading anything. And I'm, I would like to say that everything just went away like that. No, it was a process, right? right? Looking back now, I see that all of these things where I thought my life was imploding or it, it was the healing. Healing is painful. It's dirty. It's not nice. It's, it's not what you think it is. It's not like this. It takes right. time. But I would say that by the end of the year, in December, I woke up one day, like seriously, I woke up one day and it felt like the cloud had lifted. It just felt different. Come on. I felt like I was free. And I remember telling you in January that if I was any freer, I would be levitating. <laughs> That's what it felt I like. That. I really felt like I was free. I wasn't feeling any fears of, oh my God, my life is over or rejection or abandonment or depression, because depression, anxiety, like name, imagine everything you could, that could go on in your head, that happened, but God healed me of every single thing, but it didn't happen like this. It happened with His grace and not giving up. Like mm. he didn't give up on me. I right. gave up many times because it was very painful. But I thank God that he never gave up on me. And I would also say I'm grateful for the strength to keep going. Because if I didn't pray, if I didn't show up here, if I didn't read the Bible, if I didn't fast, all those things, maybe I would have given the enemy more room to keep, you know, yeah. twisting things in my head. Wow. So. Yeah. Wow. Bussel, that's an incredible story. Um, my last question for you mm -hmm. is if you could summarize everything you've just shared into one thought, you mm -hmm. know, with like, this is my story in one yeah. phrase, one thought, how would you just sum it all up now? I would say it's one of grace and love, there's, like, there's a deep love that God has for me that even I don't, I'm not fully aware of that. Um, it's a story of redemption and restoration. It's still a work in progress, yeah. but I cannot deny the work that has been done because without that work, there is nothing to build on, you know? Yeah. So he's, my foundation is what he was working on to make my feet planted so strong that nothing can shake me. So I believe that's, that's what's happened so far. Amen, I love that. And this is your story. Yeah. And what I've learned in my lifetime having conversations like this, being a pastor, is if God did it for you, yes. He can certainly do it for anyone else as well. Amen. 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 So thank you, Busola, for coming and sharing your story with us. It was my pleasure.